Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a supreme irony that the filmmaker in the room is not going to give you any audiovisual information or help. Uh, but <laughs> partly because I was asked to do this at the last minute and um, I didn't have the time. But um, I stand before you as a filmmaker, a producer, and a man whose life has been led by passions and by dreams. And I'm here for a little light relief. I'm not going to blind you with statistics much. But uh, I took as my point, of, my starting point really, that I've always loved science fiction. Its right is a guided by science, by human longing, and by the reader's demand for more and more bizarre stories. First and foremost, though, they're technology's dreamers. Sci-fi dreamt of spaceflight, and it came. It dreamt of robots, and they have come. It dreamt of cheap spaceflight, relatively, and that's come in Virgin Galaxy and intelligent robots, and they too are upon us. They've imagined the minuteness in The Incredible Shrinking Man and the vastness of the universe in Kubrick's 2001. And our scientists boldly go where no man has gone before, splitting their infinitive on the way, and presenting us both with hope of what they may achieve and fear of what the impact may be of their discoveries. And those scientists who work with stuff we can't see seem to worry us the most whether it's nanorobots or nanoparticles, it's all just too small. I can once read a story in my youth which had a great impact on my appreciation of size. I can't actually remember, and I can't find it, but I think it was either by H.G. Wells or that great visionary Philip K. Dick. But in it, someone in a first-person narrative comes to the end of life, and their spirit flies off the planet and into space. As their consciousness sails away, it looks back to see our solar system becoming very small. Later it looks back and our galaxy has become minute. Finally, it <coughs> flies past the edge of the universe and looks back to see that our universe is contained in the flash on a golden ring on the finger of a shepherd standing on a hill. The spirit of this story turned up later as the plot line of the first Men in Black films, where the Earth has been given responsibility, an intergalactic mistake I would argue, for protecting a galaxy that is the size of a gobstopper and is hidden in, yes, a ring. Now, these stories taught me then a fundamental lesson about size. Size for us humans is completely relative. Our imaginings of it are dictated by our own. To use the universe, to us, the universe is just so. To a microbe, this room might be a galaxy. To the Monty Python foot, our universe is there to be squashed. Everything for us is relative to a cubit, a foot, a chain, a yard, or a meter. We are really, really bad at imagining vastness, and even worse, at minuteness. Both defy our empirical experience and our ability to control in our minds the idea of size. And although we can perhaps try to grasp at vastness, very small little buggers are, to our naked eye, invisible and therefore quite probably dangerous. And for the last quarter of a century, we've seen the rise and rise of the invisible, at least to the layman, in the works of nanotechnologists and scientists. Many of their nano developments were predicted in the seminal book in the, on the nano world published in the 80s, but I will deal with that in a minute. It's perhaps helpful first to define what we're talking about. I'm a great fan of classical derivation, having been a classicist at one point, and it pleases me a lot that nano comes from the Greek and means dwarf. Mathematicians and scientists used to plundering the symbols and words of long past civilizations use the word nano to mean a billionth part. And thus we end up with a nano scale where a nanometer is 1,000 millionth of a meter. To give you some hold on the idea of scale, a red blood cell is 7,000 nanometers wide and a water molecule is 0.3 of a nanometer across. And scale doesn't actually stop at this atomic level. I've been on that before. In size terms, it's possible to go even smaller, as small as you like, actually. Infinity is a two-way endlessness. So there are sub nano levels of measurement, a millionth part of a millionth part of an atom. Whole new worlds of smallness. Whether they're relevant to us remains to be seen. And our nano world falls into two distinct areas. Nano science, defined as the study of phenomena and manipulation of materials of atomic, molecular, mac macromolecular scales, where properties differ significantly from those at a larger scale, and that's very important. 
and nanotechnologies, the design, characterization, production, and application of structures, devices, and systems by controlling shape and size at the nanometer scale. So we have nanomaterials, nanomeasurements, electronics, bio nanotechnology, and nanomedicine, and there are many industrial nano applications. And some of these have impacted on our lives already, can impact on the environment, and could help with the problems that beset us as climate changes. But nanoscience and nanotechnologies are not new. Chemists have been made, making polymers for decades, and nanotechnologies have been used to create the tiny features on computer chips for over 20 years. The natural world also contains many examples of nanoscale structures from milk, a nanoscaled colloid, where liquid butterfat globules are dispersed within a water-based solution. I won't be having black coffee at uh, tea time. To sophisticated nano-sized and nano-structured proteins that control a right range of biological activities such as flexing muscles, releasing energy, and repairing cells. Nanoparticles occur naturally and have been created for thousands of years as the products of combustion and cooking. Exposure to millions of pollutant nanoparticles per breath have been commonplace since our first use of fire. But how can all this nanoactivity impact or more benefit climate change? Well, I'd like first to look to nature. After all, that's who runs the planet and who over billions of years has been coming up with solutions to manufacture that are not as the heat, beat, and treat variety. Where you start with bulk material, carve it down, heat it up, beat it under enormous pressure, and treat it with chemicals. What you end up with is 96% waste and 4% product. Man is terribly good at this process and has been using it for a long time with subsequent deleterious effects on both our planet and its scarce resources. Nature, which has been around billions of years longer than our species, decided it couldn't afford such prof profligacy early on and it, because it would wipe itself out. So its processes are mostly virtuous circles of sustainability and efficiency. These are being explored through the science of biomimicry, which I profess is a particular passion of mine. It is not biotechnology, I should stress. And so great is my passion for this that I went at my own expense to talk to Janine Benyus about it in her lair in Vesula, Montana. And she's an inspirational figure. She describes biomimicry as innovation inspired by nature. Scientists and technologists take a process, a material, and explore to see if nature has an equivalent or an alternative. And biomimicry works extensively at the nano level, so I get there in the end. As you might expect, it's a powerful friend of the environment and affords us ways to step back from many of our industrial processes that are still damaging the planet. And nature crafts materials of a complexity and functionality that we can only envy. The inner shell of an abalone is twice as tough as our highest tech ceramic. Spider silk, ounce for ounce, is five times stronger than steel. Muscle adhesive works underwater and sticks to anything, even without a primer. Rhino horn manages to repair itself, even though it contains no living cells. And some of the things that already happened, including one of my favorites, which is gecko tape. Glue is a horrible industrial process, and gecko tape revolutionizes everything from carpet tiles to sticking plasters. It was only with the development of tools at the nano level that scientists could finally analyze the gecko's foot. And it's a wonder. Each gecko toe is covered with half a million little bristles. And each bristle has a very bad case of split ends. So when you look at the whole of the lizard's foot, there are literally billions of tips. If a gecko pressed all of these multi-tipped bristles against a flat ceiling, and they all made contact, the stick would be strong enough to support a 120 kilogram mat. Obviously, the tiny gecko doesn't actually need all that stick, but it's better to be safe than sorry. And as nothing is actually smooth, there is always minimal contact between two surfaces when they're placed together. So when a gecko places its foot, a very small part of those billions of bristle tips comes in contact with the ceiling. But for the gecko, that's more than enough. And he or she won't fall off down onto your pillow as you gaze up at them in the ceiling. Trust me. Gecko tape, the result of this nano uh, research, was developed from these observations. And it's very easy and very um, clean to produce artificially. You could even farm it off their feet as it grows back conveniently. So the idea of gecko farming is perhaps too far-fetched. But it can revolutionize glue production. 
the carpet tiles, sticking plasters, and so on. And there are all sorts of other reasons why this is a good idea. Replacing the environmentally damaging glue process with a more benign one. American carpet manufacturers almost bit the Biometric Institute people's hands off for site and use of this product. The desire to improve their environmental credentials being a high priority for many of the large US conglomerates, including people like Optum Down in Munich, who are also talking to Biometric Institute. Another, famous, uh, uh, another favorite of mine is Lotus Sand. I'm sure you've all heard of it, which is another biometric product. A self-cleaning building facade paint paint created by mimicking the so-called lotus leaf effect. To ensure efficient photosynthesis, it is essential that plant leaves are kept clean. Scientists observe that the leaves of the lotus plant are covered in waxy nanobumps. Dirt and dust loosely adheres to these, and when rain falls, the water balls up rather than spreading out. And the loose turf is pearled away as the water rolls off, keeping the leaf clean. The outside of the building coated in lotus sand will be cleaned by the rain, the paint providing a completely efficient natural cleaning mechanism. And again, it's not too difficult to produce what it's done. Biomimicry process at the nano level may also impact on energy production. Nature creates energy through photosynthesis. In leaves, it operates at more than 90% efficiency, producing chemical energy from carbon dioxide and water by using the energy source of the sun. Man has developed photovoltaic cells using silicon semiconductors but the process is very costly and typically only works between 14 and 19 percent efficiency in the domestic environment. Biomimicry has led to the development of dye sensitized solar cells, which mimic part of this process of photosynthesis. A dye sensitized solar cell consists of a layer of titanium dioxide nanoparticles covered with molecular dye that absorbs sunlight. I could explain how it works, but even I don't completely understand it, and anyway, we're overrunning slightly. But it works very well and very efficiently. Not only are these DSSC cells much less expensive than conventional photovoltaic cells, they are considerably lighter, much more versatile, and they can be incorporated into the fabric of the building to create, to my mind, something that the Af Africans need a lot, solar windows, awnings, blinds, and roofs. They also use much more environmentally friendly materials. And after what we heard yesterday, I've added a bit about water shortages because I want to mention aquaporins. Aquaporins are naturally occurring, occurring membranes within plant cells. They allow the transport of small water molecules whilst blocking larger molecules such as salt. Scientists are using this principle to biomimic the hourglass shape of these aquaporins to create a 100% efficient water purification technology. In a world where drinking water is an issue, I would say that's quite a powerful way forward. In a world also where an inconvenient truth in the hands of Al Gore, which I've seen, and he did it for the RSA, which I'm well aware as brilliant as that is, it leaves me at least with the impression that we're all doomed. By <laughs> and I'm not really interested in what can't be done. What I'm interested in is what can be done. Environment, which is one of the areas I feel at least offers us some hope by the way that scientists are approaching what nature can give to us in terms of uh, processes, industrial processes and ideas which change the way we create the stuff we want and we need. Because one of the problems with all of this is we carry on wanting and we carry on needing the very things that the processes that bring them to us are still damaging the planet. So we, there's, there's all sorts of issues about the way that we live our lives with us. And this isn't only at the nano level with biomimicry, and I'm sorry about this, I'm getting wrong about this as well. Architect Mike Mick Pierce, working with Arab Associates, who I've met and talked to at length, has built a mid-rise building at Eastgate in Harare. It has no artificial air conditioning and uses just 10% of the energy of a conventional building its size. This was achieved by mimicking the self-cooling mounds created by African termites. These mounds maintain their internal temperature to within one degree of 31 degrees centigrade day and night, whilst the external temperature varies between 3 and 42 degrees centigrade. And these efficiencies translate directly to the bottom line. Eastgate's owners saved $3.5 million that it would have cost to install the air conditioning system. Outside of being eco-efficient and better for the environment, these savings trickle down to the tenants, whose rents are 20% lower than those occupants in the surrounding building. And 
let's just feel good for a moment here, Michael Hopkins used precisely this approach when he designed and built Fort Palace House in Westminster. It also has this natural air conditioning system, though so whether that reduces the MP's rent, I have no idea. Um, I hope through some of these examples you can sense that nanoscience and technology and uh, biomimicry can be an enormous benefit to sustaining both us, the environment, and to help us to achieve sustainable, eco-friendly and carbon zero processes if, uh, that are important if we're to ameliorate and perhaps heal some of the present damage to the climate. And coming from the media, to my mind, nanotechnology already benefits any movement that is looking to deal with the issue of climate change, indirectly by transforming the way we can communicate socially and as pressure and campaigning groups. Nanotech has put phones and computers in my hands, which as a young man I could only dream of. My first mobile in 1986 was the size of Margaret Thatcher's handbag, <laughs> and my first computer was an Elliott 4100 that would have filled this room. Through research and development at the nano level, the modern mobile phone, the iPad, if you should not lose it, the iPad and the netbook give all of us who are lucky enough to have them a power of communication that enables us to social network, disseminate, disseminate ideas and fears, and importantly, what's going on around us, almost instantly, to anyone, anywhere in the world. 20 years ago, that was unthinkable, but that's what this has done. However, works of the nano variety often get a bad treatment from the media. Some of it originating from that book I mentioned published in 1986, which was and still is a seminal work on the subject. It's cogent and very readable. It's written by Eric Drexler, and it's titled Engines of Creation. <laughs> Sounds like a sci-fi movie. Engines of Creation, the coming era of nanotechnology. In it, Drexler outlines many of the possibilities and benefits to us of the discoveries and technologies that he theorized were to come at the nano level, many of which have arrived. Along the way, among many other ideas, he also posited the idea, dreamt of the idea, and I do think progress is about dreaming and about imagining as well as about statistics. And I speak as a pure mathematician, mathematician who makes arts films. Okay? There is, there is a connect between number and idea. Um, even as the book was, uh, yes, sorry, but along the way, among many other ideas, he also posited the idea of self-replicating robots, nanobots, the dreaded nanobots, which could be constructed to both engineer and be self-learning. But even as the book was published, he was dismissing this idea as needlessly complex and inefficient. And he was moving on to advocating desks, desktop scale molecular manufacturing systems that would be far simpler and more efficient. But damage was done, and a debate arose, that arose led by Professor Richard Smalley, which fed off what Smalley saw as the dangers of Drexler's nano vision and the cataclysm that faced us if this research was pursued. Smalley foresaw the world turning into grey goo as the nanobot self replicating and self taught turned into a sort of atomic sized Al Qaeda and took over the world. At this time, no one was researching or developing such nanobots. This completely unfounded fear was latched onto by governments and the Prince of Wales and led to an initial resistance to forms of nano research and development. I imagine that it affected funding. And something is so small you can't see it, and it's beavering away doing something which could affect one or all of us, I suppose it's natural to fear that it poses a threat. And some things which you can't see, such as bacteria or viruses, really do pose a threat to us. And it's not helped by the media and entertainment industry. The writers of the science fiction I enjoy simply love nanotechnology. Star Trek, a town called Eureka, Doctor Who, and many, many others have used nanobots or nanotechnology for their doomsday plot lines. But most nano applications are being researched or executed to improve our cognitive world. To rain on this imaginative parade, there is no current evidence that anyone is working on self-replicating nanobots in order to take over the world. Though, and I attended a two-day seminar on robotics, if the American military had their way, future wars may be fought by the man-sized robots they're presently developing to replace their foot soldiers. The Americans don't like sending people overseas. I'm far more concerned about those robots than their tiny cousins. 
And uh, Nellis Science and Technology are also active in the medical area. A film made in 1966 called The Fantastic Voyage, notable for the presence of Bracco Welsh, is the first positive medical <laughs> nano story that I can remember. Scientists discovered they could reduce a submarine with the people inside into the size of a nanobot, which can cruise the highways of the body to target and repair a gunshot wound in a diplomat. This was a long time ago who was in some way vital to the future of the planet. <laughs> and molecular machines are now, over 50 years on, being developed to be inserted into people to cure, to treat or to cure illnesses in ways that lie beyond the scope of human-sized surgeons or physicians. Sadly, they would all lack the presence of propel. One of my favorites, again, from biomimic scientists is a needle that can be put under the skin of diabetics to measure their level of blood sugar. Its insertion is painless because it's based on the design of an ostrich at stake. So after Drexler's book, nanoscience and nanotechnology did indeed take off, but people were still worried that it might all be a dangerous idea. To address the problems that were emerging from this cloud of unknowing at the nano level, there was a major report undertaken and published in 2004 by the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering called Nanoscience and Nanotechnologies, Opportunities and Uncertainties, it's really acknowledged as the major survey, certainly in this country, on things nano. And reading this quite vast report, it's clear, and you can download it from the net, it's perfectly available. It is clear that many nanotechs pose, pose no threat to us at all, but concerns do centre around nanoparticles and nanotubes that are free rather than fixed within a material, and therefore cannot wander when they're fixed. The latter's effect on us is either zero or minimal. Risks start in laboratories, working environments where nanoparticles or tubes are created, even if they are later to be fixed, and the, in the creation of, for instance, cosmetics which contain nanoparticles in free form. In particular, there have been concerns about um, nanoparticles of titanium oxides and zinc oxides being absorbed subcutaneously, and the effect on the body if this happens. Our, our skin is a very, very, very thin protection against everything. If you damage that, you're stuffed. The problem with nanoparticles also is that unlike larger particles, even those of the same material, they have a much larger surface area. Therefore, the chemical or explosive reaction when they come into contact with other material is much greater than the larger kin. Something which is non-threatening at the non-nano non level can become dangerous at a smaller level. So we cannot presume any material that is benign at the non-nano level is safe or non-toxic or non-explosive at the nano. There's also evidence that nanoparticles penetrate cells more readily than large particles, leading to fears that some forms of nanoparticle could pose problems similar to those caused by asbestos fibers. In 2004, the report noted there was still a lot of research to do into the effect short of and long term of any nano developments that there was a body of work being done about the effects on us, but almost nothing had been done on, about the impact on other species. This is still the case, and that I find that rather depressing. But the effects, at least on man, are being monitored. <coughs> www.safenano.org is one of, and probably the major body, that exists for this very purpose. And much care appears to be ta being taken with regards to exposure in laboratories and workshops that are developing or employing nanostructures. Each development, as I understand it, is being highly monitored. And five years after this 2004 report, a very, very large comprehensive study was undertaken by the IOM, which I think stands for the Institute of Miners, on behalf of safenano.org. It's titled, Emerg Nano, again, movies, E-M-E-R-G, N-A-N-O. A review of completed and near completed environment, health and safety research on nanomaterials and nanotechnology. Uh, it really is huge and goes into enormous detail. Much too much to go into here. But again, it's on the web, free for reference. And it really does add as a sort of the next bit to the 2004 report. So if you want to know anything about anything to do with nano that impacts on you, food, environment, climate, it's all in there. But the trouble with all of this is that it's it's ongoing, it's very much ongoing. The reports tell me we're keeping the eye on the ball, but that nano ball is almost ex exponentially inflating in terms of activity. It's certainly true in the biomimicry area alone. 
<coughs> and, and it's partly because of the potential of all of this is being realized. And herein lies the danger. How do you keep track of such a huge explosion of stuff? The possibility of a toxic pre nanoparticle or tube slipping through into the environment and roaming unchecked rises with scale. So it's those free nanoparticles and nanotubes which should be our concern and how they might impact on us, the planet, and its climate. There's no point in worrying about the 100 million nanostructures that are on or on the computer chip that drives the iPhone. <coughs> Sizing. The issues of toxicity, carcinogenic effects, and the potential for new pollution have to be addressed with the emergence of any new nanoparticle or tube and any application of these in small or large numbers. SafeNano.org has as its prime directive the task of making sure that safety is a priority and is observed by those researching and developing nanomaterials. Climate changes. There can be no doubt about that. Ice ages, violent swings of temperature, whatever we do will come and go. Species will die out, habitats will change. Tectonic and volcanic events will have catastrophic and planet changing consequences. The dinosaurs died out because they were too stupid to develop the science and technology to dispute <coughs> and deflect an asteroid from collision with the Earth. And our so-called dark ages were probably precisely that, as a massive volcanic ash cloud dimmed the European light. But accelerating or distorting the way in pace climate changes, as we have found out, is ill-advised and takes us into territory where the rhythms of the planet, the processes, the checks and balance that the planet has in place may not, and importantly, perhaps, cannot cope with. The planet will probably be glad to see the back of us if we don't come up to, with an accommodation with both it and our needs. Nanoscience and technology can play an important part in that quest. But suppose, just suppose, a dreamer. And through a vast effort of collective will, we could turn the clock back a bit. In the 20th anniversary edition of his book, Eric Drexler posits a molecular nano engine that he didn't cover in his first edition. This system, he suggests, would address global warming and subsequent climate change issues. He writes that it could work as possible. Molecular machinery can be used to sort gas molecules to extract carbon dioxide from air. This requires substantial energy. The process compresses a gas. But it can be done with thermodynamic efficiency. To remove 100 parts per million of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as a whole, compressing it to a liquid density for long-term storage, and I know storage is an issue, would require several terawatts of power for 10 years. But this could be provided by solar arrays with a total area of a square roughly 200 kilometers on a side. By providing the necessary molecular machinery and dropping the cost of the arrays, molecular manufacturer can make it affordable to remove and store the excess carbon dioxide that is accumulated 